The Logic of Persecution by George W. Foote. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. The Logic of Persecution by George W. Foote. Neither the cruelty of tyrants nor the ambition of conquerors has wrought so much mischief and suffering as the principle of persecution. The crimes of a Nero, the ravages of an Attila, afflict the world for a season and then cease and are forgotten, or only linger in the memory of history. But persecution operates incessantly, like a natural force. With the universality of light it radiates in every direction. The palace is not too proud for its entrance, nor is the cottage too humble. It affects every relationship of life. Its action is exhibited in public through imprisonment, torture, and bloodshed, and in private through the tears of misery and the groans of despair. But worse remains. Bodies starve and hearts break, but at last there comes the poppied sleep, the end of all. Grief is buried in the grave. Nature covers it with a mantle of grass and flowers, and the feet of joy trip merrily over the paths once trodden by heavy-footed care. Yet the more subtle effects of persecution remain with the living. They are not screwed down in the coffin and buried with the dead. They become part of the pestilential atmosphere of cowardice and hypocrisy which saps the intellectual manhood of society, so that bright-eyed inquiry sinks into bleary-eyed faith and the rich vitality of active honest thought falls into the decrepitude of timid and slothful acquiescence what is this principle of persecution and how is it generated and developed in the human mind now that it is falling into discredit there is a tendency on the part of christian apologists to describe it to our natural hatred of contradiction men argue and quarrel and if intellectual differences excite hostility in an age like this how easily was it for them to excite the bitterest animosity in more ignorant and barbarous ages such is the plea now frequently advanced no doubt it wears a certain plausibility but a little investigation will show its fallacy men and women are so various in their minds characters circumstances and interests that if left to themselves they inevitably form a multiplicity of ever-shifting parties sects fashions and opinions and while each might resent the impertinence of disagreement from its own standard, the very multiformity of the whole mass must preserve a general balance of fair play, since every single sect with an itch for persecuting would be confronted by an overwhelming majority of dissidents. It is obvious, therefore, that persecution can only be indulged in when some particular form of opinion is in the ascendant, and if this form is artificially developed, if it is the result not of knowledge and reflection but of custom and training if in short it is rather a superstition than a belief you have a condition of things highly favorable to the forcible suppression of heresy now throughout history there is one great form of opinion which has been artificially developed which has been accepted through faith and not through study which has always been concerned with alleged occurrences in the remote past or the inaccessible future and which has also been systematically maintained in its pristine purity by an army of teachers who have pledged themselves to inculcate the ancient faith without any admixture of their own intelligence. That form of opinion is religion. Accordingly, we should expect to find its career always attended with persecution, and the expectation is amply justified by a cursory glance at the history of every faith. There is, indeed, one great exception. But to use a popular though inaccurate phrase, it is an exception which proves the rule. Buddhism has never persecuted, but Buddhism is rather a philosophy than a religion, or if a religion, it is not a theology, and that is the sense attached to religion in this article. All such religions have persecuted, do persecute, and will persecute while they exist. Let it not be supposed, however, that they punish heretics on the open ground that the majority must be right and the minority must be wrong, or that some people have a right to think while others have only the right to acquiesce. 
No, that is too shameless an avowal, nor would it indeed be the real truth. There is a principle in religions which has always been the sanction of persecution. And if it be true, persecution is more than right, it is duty. That principle is salvation by faith. If a certain belief is necessary to salvation, if to reject it is to merit damnation, and to undermine it is to imperil the eternal welfare of others, there is only one course open to its adherents. They must treat the heretic as they would treat a viper. He is a poisonous creature to be swiftly extinguished. But not too swiftly, for he has a soul that may still be saved. Accordingly, he is sequestered to prevent further harm, and effort is made to convert him. Then he is punished, and the rest is left with God. That his conversion is attempted by torture, either physical or mental, is not an absurdity. It is a consonant to the doctrine of salvation by faith. For if God punishes or rewards us according to our possession or lack of faith, it follows that faith is within the power of will. Accordingly, the heretic, to use Dr. Martineau's expression, is reminded not of arguments, but of motives, not of evidence, but of fear, not of proofs, but of perils, not of reasons, but of ruin. When we recognize that the understanding acts independently of volition, and that the threat of punishment, while it may produce silence or hypocrisy, cannot alter belief, this method of procedure strikes us as a monstrous imbecility. But, given a belief in the doctrine of salvation by faith, it must necessarily appear both logical and just. If the heretic will not believe, he is clearly wicked, for he rejects the truth and insults God. He has deliberately chosen the path to hell, and does it matter whether he travels slowly or swiftly to his destination? But does it not matter whether he go alone or drag down others with him to perdition? Such was the logic of the Inquisitors, and although their cruelties must be detested, their consistency must be allowed. Catholics have an infallible Church, and the Protestants an infallible Bible. Yet, as the teaching of the Bible becomes a question of interpretation, the infallibility of each Church resolves itself into the infallibility of its priesthood. Each asserts that some belief is necessary to salvation. Religious liberty, therefore, was never entered into the imagination of either. The Protestants who revolted against the papacy openly avowed the principle of persecution. Luther, Beza, Calvin, Melanchthon were probably more intolerant than any pope of their age. And if the Protestant persecutions were not, on the whole, so sanguinary as those of the Roman Catholic Church, it was simply due to the fact that Catholicism passed through a dark and ferocious period of history while Protestantism emerged in an age of greater light and humanity. Persecution can not always be bloody, but it always inflicts on heretics as much suffering as the sentiment of the community will tolerate. The doctrine of salvation by faith has been more mischievous than all other delusions of theology combined. How true are the words of Pascal, Jamais una fait le mal, si plément et si gaiement, qu'on ton les fait pas conscience. Fortunately, a nobler day is breaking. The light of truth succeeds the darkness of error. Right belief is infinitely important, but it cannot be forced. Belief is independent of will, but character is not, and therefore the philosopher approves or condemns actions instead of censuring beliefs. Theology, however, consistently clings to its old habits. Infidels must not be argued with, but threatened. Not convinced, but libeled. And when these weapons are futile, there ensues the persecution of silence. That serves for a time, but only for a time. It may obstruct, but it cannot prevent the spread of unbelief. It is like a veil against the light. It may obscure the dawn to the dull-eyed and the uninquisitive, but presently the blindest sluggards in the penfolds of faith will see that the sun has risen. End of the Logic of Persecution by George W. Foote